All right. I think we're almost there. How are we doing, friends? Good morning. We're live. All right. So I just want to make sure that this is not a political endorsement. I try to keep politics as much as you know, out of my channel as much as possible. But I believe in health freedom. I believe that all of us um, should take, uh, the onus is on us to be healthy. And what we're seeing here throughout the world, whether we're talking about uh, Melbourne, Australia, whether we're talking about Canada, whether we're talking about the United States, I mean, many countries, the government is intruding into our lives and determining what businesses could or should be open. And I, I think a quick Trump recovery is going to give us all more health freedom. I mean, I don't know about you, but I like the ability to travel. I like the ability to, to go to Europe if I need, you know, to, to hang out with friends. I have friends. Uh, how we've built this channel is by, by traveling a lot to Canada, to doing this. I don't want to be required to have to take some sort of vaccination and have some sort of certificate or scanning my arm. And I know you probably don't want this either because that's why you watch these channels. So um, regardless of where you sit on the political fence, I think it's a we can all only pray and hope that Trump has a quick recovery. That way there can be a legitimate election uh, and, and whatever the outcome of that is, you know, we can move on. But if his health goes sideways quick, okay, what that is going, that's going to scare the crap out of a lot of people, which is not going to be good. And that's going to, to cause governments to sort of justify and overreact, uh, you know, to, to, to the virus, uh, and we might have more mandatory vaccines and, and more government intrusion into our life. So we can all hope and pray that, you know, the therapeutics are working and that Trump gets better. That doesn't mean that I think he's the best person in the whole world and I agree with everything he says. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this for our own freedom and for stability in the world because that's what that's what we want, okay? Um, so I just, I, I wanted to share this video and take this opportunity to talk about the upsides and then also review why Trump could be at increased risk for having more severe disease and, and the take home lessons for that. So here's, here's kind of the good news, friends, is guess what? The media is now changing the narrative. The media is, is so good at just pivoting. Um, they, they don't really hold to their own standards. Remember how we've reviewed on this channel how um, there was overweight people or there was pre-diabetic people who got the virus and the media used those stories to say, hey, look, everyone is uniquely, it, it, it has the same risk profile. It doesn't matter if you're old or young, you know, if you're, our kids shouldn't be in school, they should be stuck at home on their iPads, right? We were told these stories, but now because Trump is overweight and he has health issues, we can now talk about risk stratification because the media is so good at changing their standards. So check it out. So just today, there was a bunch of stories saying, hey, Trump is going to, and again, I just think this is funny. Let me just pause. Let me just hit the, hit the pause button, okay? On this channel, I'm all about sharing the truth, okay? That, that's what we like to do. We like to share the science and, and strip away the emotion from from things. And so I think the, the positive light here is we're now able to look through a more scientific objective lens instead of being so scared about this virus and realizing that not everyone has the same susceptibility to having severe disease or landing in the ICU. Remember, 80% of people who get this thing don't need to be hospitalized. Of those 20% of people who get hospitalized, less than 50% of them actually need to go into the ICU and have severe disease. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment with regards to metabolic health. But that all being said, up to now, the media has ignored those numbers. And they've said that everyone is uniquely susceptible. We need to shut down the entire economy. You know, if there were people hanging out on the beach, they were reckless grandma killers, even if they were young and weren't exposed to elderly people, right? So, so now it's socially acceptable because Trump is overweight to talk about these comorbidities to talk about the fact that being obese and overweight and having metabolic challenges sets you up to having a higher propensity and statistically speaking to have more disease severity. So I think this is a good thing. Now we can start being more rational about this. Again, a lot of people that question face masks or question lockdowns get relegated into these groups of being science deniers, but really 
what we're talking about here is anytime we question these things, we're actually basing it based upon the scientific data. If a minority of people are getting harmed by this, why does the majority need to implement all of these mitigation measures, right? Especially when we're ignoring the fact that met, uh, underlying metabolic health issue is, are, are problematic. So um, what I want to do is just kind of share with you a little bit more about what I think is kind of unique and, and where what it comes down to our health freedom uh, the silver lining of Trump getting infected is he's being treated with this Regeneron, which is an intravenous. I, mean, I think it's uh, pretty sure it's IV. Maybe it's subcutaneous, but I'm pretty sure it's an IV solution. Uh, about eight ounces, I think he got, which was a higher dose. And I believe they're in a phase two clinical trial at this point. Uh, so this is a company that make they make a lot of um, immunoglobulin, antibodies, peptides, things along those lines. I, I believe they have a history in cancer, treating cancer with biologics and things. But they created a immunoglobulin antibody that normally our own immune system would make. Uh, and the idea here is to bring down the viral load because what, as many of you know, we've talked about this for now eight months, you know, what happens in this disease, it's not really that the virus kills you necessarily, it's your own over-exaggerated immunological response that causes collateral damage that can be uh, linked to your demise. And so that's that's the problematic. So that's what's problematic from an immunopathological perspective. So the key, the, the kind of the, the impetus or the idea behind uh, a, an antibody-based treatment is to bring down the viral load so that you don't overwhelm your body's uh, immune system and you don't have the collateral damage from the cytokines and the interleukins and all that. And so uh, I, I do want you to know that this, type of therapy has been around for a while for other immune related diseases. I, how I got into this functional medicine space back in 2006 in Colorado, there was a clinic there, uh, a really well renowned immunologist, Isaac Melamed, I think he's still practicing, I'm not sure. But he was really well known for his intravenous immunoglobulin therapies, providing IgI IVIG for folks that had autoimmune disease and allergies and all that. And so, you know, the, the idea, the premise of giving exogenous preformed antibodies that could neutralize harmful antigens. So we know that the antigen, one antigen on, on the coronavirus, I think is the spike protein that can be neutralized. So, uh, it, it's kind of interesting that, that these, that these therapies have been around. Um, and you know, I used to actually sell, uh, oral uh, immunoglobulins. And so you can buy preformed immunoglobulins and take them orally. Um, they're, they're, they are good for gut health and allergies and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, anyway, friends, uh, welcome to Science on a Saturday. I see quite a few of you here. If you're enjoying this content, hit that like button. Again, if you're, if you're just now watching our videos, I'm not trying to make any political endorsements here. I'm just saying, I want stability for the world. If Trump dies and he dies quickly and he, and he gets a real severe infection, we're all screwed. I mean, what that means is all of our go governments, everyone's gonna be, everyone is watching this with like a fine tooth comb right now, right? Um, that's, that's gonna be bad for us. You might like that secretly because you don't like Trump, you don't like his politics, you don't like his personality. Okay, that's fine. But I'm sure you don't want to be locked down forever. I'm sure you don't want to have mandatory vaccines and all this stuff. So again, I'm not trying to get political here. I'm trying to look at the the upside that if Trump you know, has a mild disease, that's going to be good for a lot of us because it's going to help us realize that, hey, we now, have, we now understand this virus. We now have better therapeutics. We now know that there's risk stratification, right? So, you know, if you if you if you live with a bunch of twenty somethings in an apartment and you're not exposed to elderly people, do you need to be as precautious as a twenty something who lives with grandma or grandpa that are in their eighties? Definitely not. Like there's there's risk stratification, and we've applied this blanket, you know, one size cure all, you know, kind of uh, risk reduction strategy. You know, everyone's doing all the same things, but. Maybe not all of us need to shut down our businesses. You know, maybe healthy people should have been able to go to gyms, you know, this whole time, right? So that's what I'm trying to convey here is like, that's what the science shows is not everyone has the same risk, but being male is a risk factor. Advanced age is a risk factor. Uh, having underlying conditions, obesity, hypertension, diabetes are risk factors. Uh, in the state of Louisiana, I have some stats here for you. Um, 50, let's see, in Louisiana, the epicenter of death rates per capita in the U.S., all right? We also know that uh, the, the state of Louisiana also has a high prevalence of obesity. Um, uh, let's see, um, 
35%, 19%, and 57% of fatal cases uh, occurred in, in individuals that had uh, diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. So we know that that you know, having those uh, comorbidities are problematic. Uh, in, in contrast, you know, young people, people that don't have metabolic health, uh, don't generally have uh, the disease severity. And, and here's mechanistically what's going on. So many of you know that, look, we like to talk about the, the cellular and molecular biology here. Uh, one of the concepts that we've talked about over the years, friends, is meta-inflammation. So meta-inflammation, so metabolic-derived inflammation, it means that basically, if we think about that, l- let me just clear the layer because uh, I, I want to kind of use my hands here and kind of talk about this. A lot of us, medicine is kind of stratified into silos, right? You have immunology, you have endocrinology, you have cardiology. And so what we generally kind of think then is, well, you know, that these organs, we, we kind of have this perception, these organs don't crosstalk and communicate, but that's not true at all. So we know that our immune system is intimately dependent upon our metabolism to finance its response, okay? So if I were to inject endotoxin into you, which is a pro-inflammatory antigen, if I were to give you coronavirus, your immune system depends on your metabolism to finance and mount an immunological response. So your glucose is going to go up, you're going to have more free fatty acids because you need more cell replication, you need more amino acids, so your your skeletal muscle is probably going to be catabolized because of that infection. So this is called meta-inflammation because there is crosstalk and communication. The cytokines that are released from your immune system actually antagonize insulin in your metabolism so that they can selfishly get fuels instead of having uh, glucose and, and carbohydrates go to your skeletal muscle. So it's this beautiful relationship, and this is the field of immunometabolism, and we, we're talking now specifically about meta-inflammation. So when you're overweight, when you have ex- excessive amounts of body fat, when you have visceral adiposity, okay, you have inflammation. You have inflammation. What's that, that that's doing is creating dysmetabolism. So I In fact, this is kind of an interesting small side story. I have a client right now who has great metabolic health on the the surface, right? Like exercises, walks, uh, eats one meal a day, low carb, but her fasting insulin and her glucose are problematic. Why would that be? How could that possibly be if she's doing all of these diet and lifestyle strategies that she's been doing for a while? Well, she has a lot of underlying inflammation, so that's exacerbating her metabolic issues. So it's just... I'm using this sort of, um, you know, uh, current event to help teach you more about the body in ways that you may not have heard about before. So we're going to get into that right now. So let's just think about Donald Trump here. I know a lot of you um, don't feel very highly uh, about this person, and the media has made a good point to uh, illustrate that, hey, Donald Trump has visceral adiposity. So if you look at um, these fat cells here that are just below the lungs, those little those little droplets, those are his fat cells. They're inflamed. They're enlarged. They are releasing cytokines. So his baseline level of inflammation is already high. That's causing, that could contribute to a functional immunological exhaustion. So his immune system has been tugged and tugged and tugged because his fat cells are inflamed. So that could cause him to have increased disease severity if the doctors don't get his viral load down, okay? That's why he's been given this uh, Regeneron intravenous immunoglobulin to help to bring down the viral load. I think he's on remdesivir, which is an antiviral. So again, the, the strategies, it seems that on from what we know with limited data, trying to bring down the viral load so to so as to minimize um, the aberrant immunological response. Ugh. Okay. It looks like we're back. My my uh, stream cut out. I am sorry about that. So this is a paper that we shared on the thirty first of March. Okay. We talked a lot about immunosenescence, and this is the idea that your immune system can become functionally exhausted, and that is problematic if you get infected with this novel human coronavirus. So check out these little figures here that are on the screen. What you're looking at here is T lymphocytes. Now, let me just hit the pause button, okay? Because the media is freaking out. They're like, we don't know what's going on. We don't know the the, the prognosis, how severe or not severe Donald Trump's condition is. There's, There's one marker that we could look at. 
we could look at his neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and we can look at his overall lymphocytes. If his lymphocytes, that is white blood cells and, and specifically T lymphocytes, if they're low, that would be really problematic. And that would suggest that, hey, look, this could go sideways quick. This could be, this could go from a mild case to a really severe case. So this is the number the media should be talking about. Please let me know if you hear any physician on television talk about this because I've been trying to hear what they're looking at because the media is really curious, like what's going on? How severe is this? How concerned should we be? Is this a national security threat? Maybe, maybe not. But what the science has clearly showed is that lymphopenia or low T lymphocytes, and these are a white blood cell, um, that is indicative, uh, that's a poor sign of increased disease severity. So we haven't yet had that. That's what I would want. If I was his physician, this would be the first test that I'd be looking at, okay? Now, what you're going to see here is you have HC, that's healthy control, and these are um, number of T lymphocytes. And again, the paper that we're um, talking about here, and I shared this with you on March 31st when I had this hypothesis that what is making people more severe, what, what is lending people to be to have a more severe coronavirus uh, disease case is functional exhaustion of their immune system, immunosenescence from chronic meta-inflammation, from poor diet choices, lack of exercise, and all of that. So the paper that we're talking about here is functional exhaustion of antiviral lymphocytes in COVID-19 patients. So there is a uh, significant difference in the uh, the lymphocytes and so forth <clears throat> in, in the uh, in the in the uh, severe disease state. Okay, friends. Hey, just wanted to let you guys know and let you guys, gals know that these live sessions are brought to you by our very own product line called Myoscience. We formulated this product line to help you optimize your sleep, recovery, and support metabolic health. We have a lot of great bundles on our website over at myoscience.com. One of the bundles that uh, I wanted to let you know about, it's called the Autophagy Enhancer Bundle. We have a lot of great feedback over on Amazon and here on our website. What's unique about this is it has berberine hydrochloride with a really unique and third-party test omega-3 product. We're going to talk about fat metabolism in just a moment, but this is a nice combination formula that we've had a lot of great feedback from, from our customers over on our website. So you can use the coupon code HIH over at myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Okay, let's talk about supplies, right? Well, the virus needs supplies. And, you know, the point of talking about this is uh, up to now, up until it, it took, it's sad, right? Isn't it sad that it took Donald Trump getting sick for the media to then talk about obesity as a risk factor? I mean, what the heck? That, that not that kind of irritating? Like, you know, we get relegated into this grandma killing category and being science deniers, but many people that like myself, Paul Saladino, other people that have been uh, critical of the media's response and fear mongering with regards to this virus, um, we've been critical of the fact because we're, we, we haven't heard the science. We've just heard fear and emotion. And, and I think it's, it's really unfortunate that it took this long into the pandemic into, until, you know, things like the World Health Organization just on January 12th, I think, was the very first time that they, they acknowledged that, uh, uh, you know, cardiometabolic diseases uh, increased disease severity and that we should, be, we should all, you know, be exercising and things like that, yet gyms were closed. I mean, it was just, you know, the responses have been incongruent. But what I want to let you know about is the foods that you eat impact the fuels that a potential pathogen could use to thrive and replicate in your body. And so this is uh, a great study. The title here is Hijacking Supplies Metabolism as a Novel Facet of Virus-Host Interaction. Again, so uh, what I would like you to kind of think about this weekend, maybe you're like, well, you know, should I... Should I have that Twinkie? Should I have that donut? Should I have that ice cream? Well, you know, um, if, if you're if you're wearing a face mask and you're washing your hands and you're if you're going the extra mile to reduce exposure to a virus, don't you think you should also change your diet? I mean, don't you think? I mean, I just look. Don't call me a diet shamer. Don't call me a fat shamer. It's like I see so many people taking the extra mile. They're jumping out of the way when they see you. They're wearing a face mask or washing their hands. Or I've seen people in their car spraying what appears to be some sort of Lysol, okay? But yet, they, they put crap in their grocery cart. And, and so, this is called cognitive dissonance. Understanding that the foods that you eat make you more, increase your vulnerability or decrease your vulnerability to getting infected with the virus. And we're gonna talk about fat metabolism in just a moment. Here's a little primer. Uh, really great um, 
uh, lipidomic profile that actually w- w- was showing that the fatty acid profile in, uh, in, in this was a tissue culture study, um, uh, affected uh, replication of the coronavirus, which is really interesting. But, you know, just, just getting to this, you know, because we're hearing all the time, you know, hey, the ketogenic diet, pff, who cares? It's all about calories. It doesn't matter if you go low carb or that. Um, you know, there was a, a recent study um, that, that, that showed that, you know, fasting, it doesn't really matter. You know, if you fast or not, eat three meals a day. Um, what we need to understand, friends, is the more glucose we have circulating, that uh, lends itself to replication of viruses and, and bugs and things like that. Uh, and so the, study, the studies are, are very clear on this. Uh, individ, uh, diabetic individuals and people that have increased glycemic variability, they have increased disease severity if they get infected. So again, this is just like, look, if your neighbor or your friend is like, look, I wash my hands, I take this so seriously, but they're drinking soda or they're eating McDonald's or they're having donuts, you're like, well, dude, like, yeah, you're reducing transmission, but you're not creating a metabolic environment or a milieu that is protecting you, right, internally. Like you're doing these things externally, which is all good. That's fine. We all got to do what we, we feel that we're doing the best we can. But if you're doing all that, then you should also be changing your diet. You, you should also be exercising. You, you should also be uh, focusing on sleep because these things really, really matter. Okay. This is a really interesting paper. Uh, the title of this, again, is Characterization of the Lipidomic Profile of Human Coronavirus Infected Cells, Implication for Lipid Metabolism uh, Remodeling Upon Coronavirus Replication. So, you know, we're hearing so much here from Kate Shanahan, we're hearing from Paul Saladino, that linoleic acid, uh, and, and many other people have talked about this. Uh, Nina Teicholz, her book, um, Big Fat Surprise, went into this. We've had her on the podcast. Uh, this was now going back two and a half years ago. So the thing that we need to understand is the foods that we eat, not only is that affecting our blood sugar, but that's affecting the lipid composition of our cells. And so if you're eating a lot of industrial seed oils, cotton seed oil, corn oil, canola oil, safflower, um, you know, all of these things, grape seed, uh, they're high in linoleic acid. And we did a great, uh, we had a great podcast recently with Paul, Dr. Paul Saladino on this topic. And it turns out that the uh, linoleic acid to arachidonic acid ratio in infected cells affects viral replication of uh, cells that are infected with the coronavirus, okay? So, you know, we don't know all the details, how this translates into humans. I mean, there's a lot going on here. But the, the point of kind of sharing this with you um, is we should all make, look, if we're, if we're gonna use this, this principle, live our life through this principle of abundance of caution, we hear people say that. Oh, my, out of an abundance of caution, I'm not gonna take an airplane, I'm gonna drive my car. Out of an abundance of caution, we're gonna use social distancing measures in this coffee shop, okay? So if we're gonna go and, and live our lives using that as kind of the, the, the underlying principle, then we should also, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our consumption of industrial seed oils because it seems that linoleic acid and other uh, omega-6 fats can affect the, the replication of this virus uh, and, and lends it, lend itself to increase um, replication. So again, this is just one of, of many studies that have kind of been looking at the lipidomic analysis. And and if we take a step back and we look at, at um, the, the the foods that are consumed by individuals who have the disease comorbidities that are linked with increased disease severity, we know that industrial seed oils uh, it, it are some of the foods that people are eating, right? You don't get morbidly obese eating avocados and egg yolks, I mean, and butter. I mean, let's be honest, right? You're probably consuming potato chips, um, fried foods, refined oxidized, uh, uh, oxidized fats and things like that. So uh, again, this, this goes back to what I've been saying here is like, look, if we're gonna do everything to reduce transmission of the virus, we also should be striving to optimize our diet. Um, uh, you know, I understand. People might think I'm weird for having backyard chickens and, and eating organic on the label, but don't judge me if, if you're not doing that, but you're wearing your face mask in your car because you're doing what you think is best and I'm doing what I think is best. And I'm saying there's probably evidence now f- for doing both things. If we're gonna reduce transmission and double down on that, then we gotta double down on our diet, okay? And thankfully now it's socially acceptable and the, the media has made it acceptable that we can now talk about disease comorbidities. We can talk about obesity. And so this is great. This is good news that Donald Trump got sick. I mean, I hope he 
doesn't die, right? That would that would throw our, our world into a tailspin. I mean, literally, you think about civil war, you think about the the election, the economy, national security. I mean, this would be really problematic. I know a lot of you don't don't like the guy. I mean, he says a lot of silly things, let's be real. Um, but the good news here is now we can talk about things. We can put obesity on the table and say, hey, look, maybe Trump got this because, you know, because uh, he was obese. So let's let's make let's talk about the obesity um, yeah, situation in our in our you know, uh, world. Let's stop subsidizing unhealthy food. Let's, let's start making exercise, you know, part of the, the principles out of abundance of caution that we should all be doing. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at friends. Uh, as always, thanks for being here science on a Saturday. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to make this political at all. Um, is my eye still messed up? (laughs) Face mask in your car. Helen, you know, my stepmother, um, who used to be a nurse, retired nurse, uh, and I were talking about that, you know, the other day, we're seeing so many people with face masks in their car. I mean, it's, it's absolutely bananas. Um, someone says, so why is it a good thing? Uh, again, it, it's a good thing if Donald Trump has a mild case. It's a good thing for all of us. It's a good thing because that means that, hey, our therapeutics have caught up. With, we now know how to better manage this disease. Um, even if, if a 74 year old individual who obviously doesn't really care that much about, uh, their health gets really, doesn't get that sick after being infected. I think that's a good thing. That means that we definitely, um, have better tools now, especially if we catch this early. So to me, I think that's a good thing. Now, if if he goes sideways quick, then that's going to scare the pants out of it. Everyone's going to be freaked out, right? Um, the economy is going to go sideways. People are going to, it's just going to be a lot of uncertainty and instability. Um, so, and Antonio says, uh, never feel good about bad things that happen. No, 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 no. Look, uh, let me just clarify. I'm not saying it's a good thing if Trump, uh, has severe disease. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying here is, uh, you know, if this is a mild case, it's actually a good thing. Um, it's a good thing. So let's just see. Let me just, I'm reading some comments here. I just want to make sure that, uh, that, uh, I'm not being, Okay, Marion says, I thought COVID was a hoax until my test came back positive. Um, so I just want to clarify, I've never said coronavirus is a hoax. I've felt that our our policies and our intrusion into our personal lives were, were um, not on par with the relative risk that coronavirus has on us. And so I have criticized that. Um, so what else do we have? Uh, Zunajar says, love or hate Trump. If something happens to him, we are screwed. Yes, exactly. So that's what I was saying. Um, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. What else do we have here? Um, what else? Um, someone, uh, Cassis Clay says, they still don't teach nutrition to medical students. Uh, it's like engineers not caring about the fuel in a car. Yeah, I know. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, we got to focus on, we got to focus on, on health. Uh, so friends, what questions do you have? Um, there, there, there's a question here with him taking hydroxychloroquine previously, uh, will that help him get through recovery? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, to my understanding is hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, it's given to patients with autoimmune disease. So it it seems to have some sort of, uh, anti-inflammatory benefit. Um, so him taking it in the past, could that, Let's check this out. That's a, that's a really good question. With, with Trump taking hydroxychloroquine in the past, could that have reduced his uh, baseline level of inflammation and then helped him now? That that could be true. I don't know when he stopped taking it. Rumor uh, has it that he's taking zinc, vitamin D, and uh, melatonin, all things that I take, all things that actually, incidentally, we, we do have over on our website. But uh, I, I don't know if the hydroxychloroquine in the past was protective now. It's a great question. Ted Graves, what's going on? Ted says, the virus has been engineered to act like venom. Uh, We will all be exposed to this disease. Yeah, I mean, if one of the most uh, tested and most protected individuals on planet Earth got infected with this, I think that's, that means that we're all going to be exposed uh, to this, okay? Now, I I know a lot of you could say, well, Trump didn't wear a face mask and all this sort of stuff. Okay, well, that's, I understand what that argument, but also... Um, there's people that get this that did everything right. Okay, remember, viruses are invisible. Right? We, we don't know, you know where you're getting it. So um, what that means is, is sure, uh, if you're at risk, take precautions, yeah. But it also means 
You need to simultaneously prioritize your health, focus on your health, focus on exercise, focus on stress management, uh, eat whole real food, all of that. How you breathe. Gosh, um, really important stuff, friends. Um, when you're wearing your face mask, try when you're in the grocery store. Um, I pull mine down so it's just my nose is exposed. I'm breathing through my nose, so I'm not I'm not inhaling through the face mask. Nasal breathing, I think, is really important. Um, really, really important here and all that. So um, um, someone says, how much would... How much will taking vitamin D after infection help? I don't know about that. Um, is there, I don't know. I mean, maybe some. I don't know if the data is there. You could probably bring your levels up pretty quickly. Look, if, if I got infected or a family member got infected, I would give probably 50,000 IUs a day. Um, that's what I would personally do, maybe up to 80,000 I use a day. In short, for short-term situations, I've had some clients that have had multiple sclerosis when there's a flare-up or scleroderma or something. They'll take really high doses for a short period of time. Um, you wouldn't want to take that forever. Now, this could be several days, five days, but you just would want to crank it up because there are vitamin D receptors on the, uh, on the immune system. Chuck V says, uh, shouldn't each positive test include the cycle threshold achieved to detect the virus? That's a question I don't know the answer to, but great question here. Um, someone uh, says, mass that everyone wears doesn't protect individuals. So, okay, Micah. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, perhaps. Perhaps that's the case. Um, I don't really understand the rationale there. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll table that one. How, how could the mask protect someone else but not protect you? Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, why are some people super spreaders? I have no idea. I know a lot of people have been talking about that. Uh, I mean, that's definitely interesting. You know, what, what are, um, maybe they have a high viral load uh, initially. So that's, that's a really good question. RJM Station says, uh, medical doctors are saying coronavirus is the cause of death, even though most have not been, uh, yeah, verified. Yeah, so the numbers are probably pumped up a little bit. Um, and she says, right, so if you're wearing masks, uh, do so maybe by time while you get healthier. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. Look, I'm not anti-mask for, for all situations. I, I started wearing a mask in February, guys. February, why? Well, I was getting a surgical procedure when I was going to Canada my daughter and I wore a face mask on the airplane the entire trip. You're in a confined environment. That's a high uh, you know, degree of probability that you'll get infected in an airplane. All right, if you're gonna get infected, recirculating air, right? I'm not saying don't travel, but that's where you wanna wear a mask. Wearing a mask on a hiking trail, wearing a mask in your car by yourself. I mean, come on, let's just be be real about this. Probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so so that's what, what we did. I did not want to get the coronavirus right before I was undergoing surgery. That would have been very problematic. Even as a, a you know, at the time I was 37 years old, healthy, that could have, you know, caused me to, to, you know, fall into the severe disease state. So I was wearing a mask and I was the only person wearing a mask on the airplane. It was, it was February 21st. Everyone was looking at me like I'm an idiot, like I'm crazy, but I'm like, I didn't want to say to every person, hey, I'm getting surgery. I want to be careful. But so, um, again, I, I want to, I want to, be very clear, I'm not anti-mask for all situations, but I'm anti-mask when you're checking your mail. I'm anti-mask when you're on a hiking trail. Give me a break. You're touching your face and all this on a hiking trail. The risk of outdoor transmission is, is very minimal, um, and you want to be breathing fresh air. That's why you're in the woods anyway. So, so um, I think context needs to matter. Uh, uh, Zunajar5 says, check out Mike's essential fatty nutrients, the K2 uh, D3 combo. Um, it's good stuff. Thank you, buddy. I think it's good stuff as well. Joe says, because my red pill play list uh, believes COVID-19 is a hoax. Um, I wouldn't say it's a hoax, man. I, you know, this virus is real. I've known now 18 people that, that have gotten the virus that have tested positive. The virus is very real. Is our governmental response over exaggerated is it commensurate with the 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 actual risk for most people probably it's pretty over exaggerated there's been a lot of uh, politicalization from this there's been you know the economic fallout all this race stuff all this unrest um you know was the virus manipulated by the media probably uh, you know they they had uh, coverage that that was over exaggerated that everything like that so um uh, but the virus is not a hoax uh, Rob Bacon says, I got the virus in February. Um, interestingly, 
The guy I got it from was found dead two days later. Rob Bacon, that's crazy. And by the way, friends, uh, Rob Bacon has been uh, on our channel for a long time. How old or what was the, you know, kind of characteristics of the guy who got it that died? Um, what it was, well, okay, so we have Super Tap 007 says, does exhaustion increase risk of infected infection? Yeah, I would imagine Trump has been on overdrive. Dude, yeah, I mean, so this is the thing. Trump is has a lot stacked against him, right? All the stress, all the travel. He's overweight. He probably has pre-diabetes or some sort of dysglycemia, might have some sort of hypertension. And he's a male and he's 74. The, the, the cards are not in his favor. From a probability standpoint, if you were to ask most physicians, he could be in the highest risk category. And that's why I'm saying it's a good thing if he comes out of this on the other side and it's a relatively mild disease because that's going to tell the world that, whew, okay, so we know it's dangerous. We know 400,000 people throughout the world have died. We have 6 billion people on planet Earth, 400,000 of 6 billion people. That's a small percentage of people. The relative risk for most people is pretty low. So we can take a deep breath. We shouldn't be so, so scared to go to the grocery store. Maybe we don't need to wear our face masks on hiking trails, right? That would be that would tell the world that we can take a chill, take a chill pill. And maybe then we can focus on actual health and we can focus on diet, lifestyle, exercise, stress management, stress reduction, all of that. That would be good. So that's what I'm banking for, friends, because I'm maybe it's for selfish reasons, but there's been so much focus on slowing down the transmission of an infectious disease, but we've been unable to talk about, because people say it's selfish, it's, it, you know, your grandma killer and all that, by talking about preventing metabolic disease. Many, many people die from diseases that are easily treated with lifestyle, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, all of these things are even neurologic disorders like you know, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, all of these are easily modifiable with diet, with exercise, but we've never been able to talk about them. No one has cared up to now. So I, I'm hopeful that Trump will you know, recover quickly, that we can have a legitimate election and, and move on. You know, Because if this goes sideways fast, it means all, all kinds of vaccination mandates and all of these sort of things. And, and, and look, I'm, as a libertarian, less government intrusion into our lives is, is, is what I'm all about. Um, Okay, um, CS Survivors uh, says, survivors of COVID uh, long haulers who have um, uh, no risk factors are suffering from long-term health effects. CS, I'm with you. I have several clients who are in the long hauler category. You know what? Uh, so what I'm saying here is we don't ignore the virus. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we all go out and get this thing. There, there is that risk of, of, of having being a long hauler. And that's not cool, you know? You don't want, I mean, look, um, there's a risk that you could get Lyme disease by going in the woods. Does that mean you never go into the woods? No. People can get Lyme disease in parks now. I, I know several people that were playing with their dog at a park, got a tick, infected, got Lyme disease, had a lot of complications from that. That doesn't mean you're never going to go to the park. It means you exercise caution. It means when you leave the park, you know, you wipe, you make, you check for ticks. If you go hiking in the woods, you check for ticks. So we need to do the same thing with regards to the virus, okay? If you're going on an airplane, wear a face mask. Make sure you're getting good sleep. Up your vitamin D. Do all the things to minimize. You know, just because you get exposed to the virus doesn't mean you're going to get infected. Think about that, right? How many people live on on in the United States, 330 million. How many people have gotten the virus? Six million, right? To think that this thing was not seeded uh, earlier than than March, like this thing was circulating. People were coming from China, uh, from other parts of the world that had it. This thing has been seeded in our communities. Not everyone got it, okay? So that's the other thing we need to keep in mind is like, you know, probably your metabolic health uh, can help prevent early viral replication too. So again, you know, if we're gonna double down on strategies to slow down the spread, we gotta double down on strategies to optimize health. I'm not denying science, I'm just being real here. Okay, um, let's see what else, what else what do we got here? Um, anyway, friends, was this helpful? Was this fun? Um, 
If you're just now joining in, you might want to rewatch some of this because we talked about a lot of science. Uh, super helpful, super happy, and, and and hopefully this was helpful that you were here. Um, have a great rest of your weekend. Remember to check out our show sponsor, myoscience.com, over on their website. And uh, yeah, that's it for now, friends. If you want these slides, I'll, I'll put links below. Um, this one was a good one here. Um, just came out in diabetes. And uh, again, our show sponsor, MyoScience, is over at M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. You can use the coupon code MyoScience at checkout. And have a good rest of your weekend. And we'll catch you all soon. Bye now.